the murder of Percival Thompson, the evidence against Mary Thompson is unequivocal. You will learn of her finger marks on the knife that was plunged six times into the chest of her husband. You will learn of how that same weapon was discovered lying on her bedside the next morning. And you will learn of Mrs. Thompson's claims that she has no memory of these events. The prosecution calls their first witness. <clears throat> Mrs. Mary Thompson was a patient of mine. She'd been having memory lapses. I suspected she was experiencing what we call a fugue state. I don't require a diagnosis, doctor. Was there another reason that Mrs. Thompson sought your professional help? Yes, she was having disturbing fantasies. Of what? Killing her husband. And in these fantasies, how did she kill her husband? She stabbed him repeatedly in the chest. And you took these fantasies quite seriously, did you not? Yes, I did. So seriously, in fact, that you personally contacted Mr. Thompson to warn him that his life might be in danger. I wrote Mr. Thompson a letter. I was unable to contact him personally. Thank you. Those are my questions. Dr. Ogden, tell us more about this fugue state. It's a term coined by the French psychologist Pierre Genet to describe people who disassociate from their normal identity and take refuge in a new one. And is this a conscious decision? No, it's completely unconscious. In fact, the sufferer typically has no memory of the episode. So this would explain why Mary Thompson has no memory of the night her husband was murdered. Yes, it would. Those are my questions, Your Honor. Uh, Your Honor, I wish to redirect. Proceed. Dr. Ogden, would it be possible for someone to feign this so-called state? To what end? Well, to murder one's husband and blame it on a psychological anomaly. I would suggest there are better ways to kill one's husband than to leave a trail of evidence and hope to be judged criminally insane. So you agree that this woman should be committed to an asylum for life? Of course. One cannot be allowed to kill one's husband and simply get away with it. Those are my questions. Is there any mail? Thank you. You have condemned her. Mary Thompson is innocent. Baker says that the cakes will be ready at four o'clock, but he closes at five, so you can't dilly-dally. And there for the wedding? No, for the rehearsal dinner. Are you even listening? The rehearsal dinner? What's to rehearse? It's just two I do's, a pick on the lips, and one of them gets a ring. A wedding is a very solemn occasion, Thomas. It may mean nothing to you, but it did to me, and it does to them, and I am going to make sure that at least they have a decent wedding. Oh, Julia! Margaret, how nice to see you. I'm so glad I bumped into you. Dinner is set for 7 o'clock. I've arranged for the priest to come to run through the bells. How wonderful. Thank you, Margaret. Oh, uh, there won't be an organist, so we'll have to hum the wedding march. Oh! <laughs> uh, this one, sir, should be about two knuckles longer than this side. Then we go long over short, up through the middle, fold this side into a bow, hence the name. Come around here. When my Aunt Azalea taught me this, sir, there was a rabbit coming out of a hole next to a tree. There was a whole fable. It was very confusing. Nonetheless, she did teach me that the sign of a true gentleman is being able to tie your own bow tie. Not that I'm suggesting you... I wouldn't disagree, George. Well, look at you. Um, <laughs> isn't it bad luck for the bride to see the groom in his wedding suit? Uh, sir, I believe that's the other way around. You should be fine. Doctor? I dare say I should marry you more often. I think once in a lifetime is quite sufficient. Thank you. How was your testimony? Well, I thought it went fine until I received this. You have condemned her. Who sent this? I have no idea. It came in the afternoon post. It was postmarked at noon, two hours ago. Right after my testimony. William, I told the court that she should spend the rest of her days in an asylum. If she is innocent, I may well have condemned her. The trial's half over and you want to start an investigation. Aren't you two about to get married? <clears throat> Uh, sir, Station House Number 5 investigated the case, and as we know, they aren't always as thorough as they could be. Not that they'll enjoy having that pointed out to them. Who sent the postcard? I have no idea. And why send it to you? Why not the lawyer, or the police for that matter? Whoever sent it must have felt that I would seek the truth. Right, your first job is to find out who sent the postcard. I suppose we'll start at the Empress Hotel. If you find anything, it will be my personal pleasure to go to Station House 5 and request their files. William, look. Excuse me. Yes. Where else might someone find one of these? Oh, we leave a complimentary card in every room, sir. So it could have been sent by any guest. Or anyone passing through this lobby. 
don't narrow our list of possibilities much. No, but think of this, Julia. The sender could have chosen any card. Why send one that could only have come from this hotel? They wanted me to come here. Something relevant to this case happened here. What if Mary Thompson was here the night of her husband's murder? Perhaps the sender saw her here. Why not simply state that directly on the card? The sender may not want to be identified. This is a hotel, after all. Indeed. <clears throat> Excuse me, Detective yes. William Murdoch. We'd like to have a look at your register. Uh, what was the night again? His body was found the morning of April 11th. Right, we're looking for a Mary Thompson who checked in on April 10th. Have a Madeline Thompson checking in at 11 p.m. Madeline? Persiana Fuchsia will often adopt a new identity. This could be her. Wasn't she found in her home the next morning? Excuse me. When did Mrs. Thompson check out? Yes. 3.30 a.m., April 11th. What was the time of death? According to Dr. Grace, the time of death was 2 a.m., and she was at the hotel until 3.30. 3.30? Why would she open leave a hotel in the middle of the night? We don't know, sir. She has no memory of the evening in question. Where was the husband killed? At their house. Eight blocks away. You need to confirm that this Madeline was, in fact, Mary Thompson. We'll need a photograph. A mugshot should suffice. Station house number five should have one. That's her. This is the woman who checked in at 11 o'clock on the night of the 10th and checked out at 3.30 a.m. the next morning. The night clerk was here when she checked out, but that is the woman I saw check in, yes. Very good. I'll be needing that. This. My God, this is incredible. I just assumed she'd done it. She assumed. This changes everything. And you concluded that this was the murder weapon? It matched the wounds exactly in depth and breadth. Did you find finger marks on the knife? We did. They belonged to the accused, Mary Thompson. Hmm. Thank you, Inspector. Those are my questions. Inspector Davis, were you aware that Mary Thompson has an alibi for the time of her husband's death? No. I... Your Honor, I would like to introduce, as Exhibit A, the hotel ledger, which shows that Mary Thompson checked into the Empress Hotel at 11 p.m. and did not check out until 3.30 a.m., two hours after the time of her husband's murder. Your Honor, this is new information, potentially unfounded. The name here is for Madeline Thompson. According to Detective Murdoch, Rodney James, the hotel clerk at the Empress Hotel, identified Mary Thompson as the woman who checked in. Detective Murdoch? You attest to all of this? Yes, I do, Your Honor. It means nothing. She could have left the hotel, killed her husband, and returned to establish an alibi. If she was merely trying to establish an alibi, why check out at 3.30? She could have stayed all night. Detective, is Station House 4 working for the defense? We are working for the truth. As am I. I'm convinced she killed her husband, and I intend to prove it. Well, why not? It wouldn't be the first time you believed a woman killed her husband, and she turned out to be innocent. You bring your evidence, I will bring mine. Right, if Mary Thompson didn't kill her husband, we've got to prove it. So what's the plan? We know she was at the Empress Hotel for at least part of the night in question. I'll send Higgins to the Empress Hotel, talk to the night clerk, see if anyone else saw her. We should also try to determine who the real killer might be. Who the victim is? What did he do? He was a businessman, I believe. Follow the money. Crabtree, dig into Mr. Thompson's business dealings. I will. So what are you standing around for? I believe we're supposed to be at the rehearsal dinner. What time is it? Bloody hell! Here they are. Mrs. Brackery? Constable. Where have you been? She's been driving me crazy. You're lucky I was only getting there when I did. Mark, sorry we're late. Oh, no, don't be silly. It's what rehearsals are all about. <laughs> Detective. Mrs. Brackenry? Father Clements has been waiting half an hour. I thought that's what rehearsals were all about. Oh, don't try to be smart, Thomas. It doesn't suit you. All oh, right, everyone. Father Clements doesn't have much time, so we'll get right to it. Detective, you will be at the front of the aisle with your best man. Who is your best man? Oh, I, I don't... What does a best man do? Well, traditionally, a He best... gives you the ring. Well, I have the ring. Well, pick a best man, give him the ring, and he'll hand it back to you. Just do it. Right. Uh, George, if, if you would please. Sir, do you really... Well, I don't know what to say. Uh, yes, of course. Uh, well, I, I'm honored, sir. I won't let you down. Oh, right. Very good. Thank you. Well, get up there with him. Go up, 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 up. Wonderful. Excellent. Now... Dr. Grace, yes, as a maid of honor, you are the first down the aisle. So, you must start marching the moment the organist begins to play the wedding march. <sighs> 
Traditionally, this is the moment where the father of the bride takes your arm to lead you down the aisle. But seeing as your father has passed, you'll have to do it on your own. Actually, I was wondering if you might give me away, Inspector. Oh, I'd be honored. No drinking before the wedding, then. All right, everybody. Please hum. Mm -hmm. Not too fast, Dr. Grace. Remember to follow the beat. It's step together, step. Now, Thomas, you step in with the bride. Mm -hmm. Well, very nice. Well done. She's done this before, Margaret. <laughs> Yes, and I take it from here. Thank you for okay. that rousing rendition. Thank you. As we discussed, I will be foregoing the traditional mass in favor of a service in English. Why don't you just get so married and have women with it? Everyone's here. Musicians aren't. You've done them to the altar. What more is that? Wedding waltz, Thomas. Don't you remember the wedding waltz? Oh, no, of course you don't. You were three sheets to the wind by then. And from there, we will proceed directly to the vows. I will ask you if you take your bride in sickness and in health till death do you part and you will answer I do and I will ask you the same question and you will answer I do and then you will pass William the ring uh, so, thank you George and we'll leave that for tomorrow oh, well, of course oh, I best hold on to that sir are you sure George I'm the best man Alexander Wainwright. He was the victim's business partner. What kind of business? Manufacturing. They moved to Toronto in January to set up a tire factory. The two of them bought an old mattress factory on Dufferin Street and were in the process of converting it when Thompson was killed. Anything out of the ordinary? Well, since Thompson's death, Wainwright has been liquidating all the business's assets. Sounds fishy. Now, see, sir, I would think a fish would make almost no sound at all. I've never understood... Uh, you're right, though, sir. Both men signed an agreement stating that in the case of either man's death, all the assets of the business would accrue to the other. That's interesting. Why would they sign such an agreement? I don't know. The lawyer drafted the agreement at the request of Wainwright, and the lawyer said he'd never met Thompson. Apparently, he was something of a recluse. When was this agreement signed? April 4th, a week before he was killed. Now that is interesting. This is Mr. Thompson. Yes, it was taken in Kingston, just after we formed our partnership. First, you brought the know-how, I brought the money. We were going to make a fortune. Anyway. You're not here to talk about my sad story. I'd like to know about the document giving you 100% of the company in the event of your partner's death. It was a perfectly legitimate business agreement. Signed a week prior to your partner's murder? The timing is suspicious. I'm sure it strikes you as suspicious. Unfortunately, I can't talk about it right now. I have an important engagement. Perhaps you'd prefer to continue this conversation down at the station house. I can't. I'm due to give testimony on this exact matter. Questions will be asked and answered. If you have any remaining, I'll answer them when I'm done. We'd arranged to meet for breakfast. When Percy didn't arrive, I went to his house. The door was locked and there wasn't an answer. And were you concerned? I had a feeling something wasn't right. So I summoned a constable. And what happened then? I found Percy, stabbed to death in his bed. And Mrs. Thompson? We found her in the next room asleep, a bloody knife beside her. What happened when you tried to awaken her? She looked at the knife and said I killed him. I finally killed him. I've seen Detective Murdoch smile exactly 343 times. 342 of which were when Dr. Ogden walked into his office. The other time was... What? Well, I'm asking you. Uh, Henry, Detective Murdoch has chosen me to be his best man. Yes, I am fully aware of that, George, as is everyone else in this station house. And as best man, it is incumbent upon me to give a toast, extolling the union of the bride and the groom in an amusing yet heartfelt manner. Now, he smiles when he sees her. Yet, he's not the smiley sort. He smiles at lots of things. Uh, every time he solves a case. In fact, he smiles twice. Once when he just thinks that he's solved the case, and then again when he actually has. It's quite funny, Henry. I might use that. Henry he thinks he solved it. What have you found out about Mary Thompson's movements on the night of the murder? Uh, well, she checked in with the name Madeline, sir. Uh, she arrived at 11 p.m. The bartender remembers seeing her around midnight in the lounge having a drink with a gentleman. Who was he? Uh, he didn't know. He only saw the man from behind. He had dark hair, though. All right. What about the night clerk? Well, he's still asleep, sir. He was the night shift. Oh, Henry, wake him up. This can't wait. Sir. He could be the sender of the postcard. Possibly. But how do we find out? You're with a man. 
You're both sitting together in the hotel lounge. I can't see. He has dark hair. Yes, there is a man. We were walking down the hall. Do you know this man? Yes. Who is it? I, I can't see his face. I'm leaning on him. Are you drunk? No. I'm, I'm tired. I'm so dizzy and tired. I can barely stand up. Of course she was tired. It was 3.30 in the morning. The way she described it. I think she may have been drugged. Where were they headed? To the front desk. Hey, Guinness, where's that night clerk? Uh, he'll be in at noon, sir. Noon? Get him in here now. I can't. He's been called in for questioning by Station House 5. Oh, bloody Davies. Dr. Grace, how can we help you? I've just been subpoenaed to testify against Mary Thompson. Dr. Grace, at what time did you determine the victim died? Between 12.30 and 2 a.m. And how did you determine that? Well, there were a number of factors. Lividity, for one. Oh, which is the extent to which the blood settles into the lower parts of the corpse. Hmm? Yes, that's correct. What other factors? Internal body temperatures. A corpse will cool at a very specific rate depending on the ambient temperature. Hmm. Well, how did you determine the ambient temperature at the time of death when you weren't in the room? I estimated. So you guessed. And the initial body temperature. Different people have different body temperatures at different times. I assume 98 degrees. So you guessed again. Is it fair to say that with every estimate and assumption there would be a margin of error? Yes, of course. And when compounded, these errors could throw off your calculations by a wide margin. I suppose. Well, it's possible, therefore, that the victim, in fact, could have died at, say, 4 a.m. instead of 2. Yes, it's possible. Thank you. Mr. Prue, were you the night clerk on duty when Mrs. Thompson checked out of the Empress Hotel? Yes, I was. And what time was this? 3.30 in the morning. And was uh, she with anyone at the time? Yes. Her husband. Her husband? Yes. So despite the opinion of the coroner, Mr. Thompson was alive at 3.30? Yes, very much so. Thank you. I hate to admit it, Julia, but if Mr. Thompson was alive at 3.30, then his wife very well could have killed him. If you believe Dr. Grace to have been wrong in her calculations... Sir? Doctor? George. Sir, if we could have a moment... Sir, wonderful news. Mr. Pendrick has arranged for a, a beautiful coach for your marriage. Oh, regrettably, the lads are talking about attaching noisemakers to it. Empty tin cans and whatnot, nothing explosive, but as your best man, I thought you should be for Excuse me. William, this was sent to the courthouse. The man she was with was not her husband. George, I need you to go to Wainwright's office. On the wall there, you'll find a portrait of Mr. Wainwright and Mr. Thompson. Please bring it here as quickly as you can, sir. Mr. Prue, uh, how did you know the man with Mrs. Thompson was her husband? They were wearing matching wedding rings. You don't see that very often, a man wearing a wedding ring. Mr. Prue. Sir, thank you, George. Excuse me. Uh, Your Honor, new evidence may have emerged, and defense requests a short recess to review it. Tonight, any questions you have, you can put before the court now. Thank you, Your Honor. <clears throat> One moment, please. Look, I can't do this. What if the night clerk identifies the man who is with his husband? Then that will be the truth of it. My job is not about finding the truth, it's about defending my client. Detective Murdoch, do you have something to say? Your Honor, we need to confirm that it was indeed Percival Thompson whom the night clerk saw on the night in question. I have a photograph of Mr. Thompson. How are we to know that this is in fact the no. defendant's husband? Ask his wife. The defense has no further questions. Well, I do, detective, if you will. Your Honor, this is highly irregular. Duly noted. Proceed. Mrs. Thompson, do you see your husband, Percival, in this photograph? Yes. Could you please point to him? Thank you. Mr. Prue, is the man that you saw with Mrs. Thompson on the morning of April 11th in this photograph. Yes. Could you please point to him? Are you quite sure? I'm positive. I never forget a face. 
But the court records show that the witness indicates the man he saw on the night in question with Mrs. Thompson was Alexander Wainwright, not Percival Thompson. So your contention is that Wainwright murdered his partner. That's why he arranged for Thompson to sign that agreement. He knew that with his partner dead, Wainwright would become the obvious suspect. He had to frame someone else. He knew about Mary Thompson's fugue episodes, knew that she would have no memory of them. How did he know she was having such an episode on the night in question? Thompson could have informed him. They were partners after all. That's speculation. Well, do you have a more compelling theory? <sighs> Wainwright drugged Mrs. Thompson. He took her key. He then went and stabbed her husband to death. He returned to collect Mrs. Thompson. He was too drugged to know what was happening. He brought Mrs. Thompson home, clasped her hand around the murder weapon, and then placed her in the room next door to her dead husband. Knowing she would still be there when he summoned a constable the next day. It's a good theory. I would just like to hear what Mr. Wainwright has to say. Mm, as would I. Uh, this is a private meeting, Constable. Please allow me this indulgence, Your Honor. What have you, George? Sir, there's no sign of Wainwright. His office has been cleaned out, same with his house on Clancy Street. Did you speak with his lawyer? I did. Wainwright was there most of the morning. He's cashed out his company's holdings in the form of bearer bonds. He's fleeing with his ill-gotten gains. Thank you, George. Post constables at all railway stations. Sir. Given that this is Station House Number 5's case, perhaps they could assist with a few constables of their own? I'll speak with Inspector Davis. You'll get whatever you need. Your Honor, in light of this new evidence, the Crown hereby removes all charges against Mrs. Thompson. Mr. Bennett, you can inform your client that she is free to go. Thank you, Your Honor. God, thank you enough. Thank you, Detective. You could not have given me a better wedding present. <laughs> you are very welcome, Dr. Ogden. Were we meant to give each other gifts? <laughs> Let's get married, Mr. Murdoch. Indeed. No, I need them to be equal. So just put it over two rungs to the right and everything will be okay. Beautiful. All right. No, uh, you need to move it back at least a foot. We need to fit eight tables in here. Thank you. All right. One, two, three. Perfect. Hurry on, Higgins. We'll be late. You're not going in uniform? Of course not. I bought a suit especially for the occasion. I am best man after all. Oh, the ring. Best not forget that. All right, where is it? I don't have it. Higgins, I don't have time for this. Why would I take the ring, George? Oh, I don't know. Maybe because you're jealous that Detective Murdoch picked me to be best man. More likely because you've been lording that status ever since it was granted. Lording? You've used the term best man exactly 343 times in the last two days. All right, fair enough. I see how you could take it that way. I apologize for said lording. Now please just give me back the ring. George, I don't have it. And if you don't, you best tell him sooner than later. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. Oh, Julia, it's so beautiful. I don't think it's too white. It's not white, it's cream. Anyone can see that. And if they can't, that's their bother. That must be your bouquet. Thank you. Is it okay? This is Thompson. I'm so sorry to interrupt, but I'm leaving town and I wanted to thank you. You saved my life. I'll get it. I couldn't be happier for you. When are you leaving? Today, on May 632. I've decided to stay with my sister for a while. I understand completely. Thank you, Dr. Ogden. And I wish you the very best. And are you, Mary? A bit nervous, are you? A bit, sir, I suppose. Don't worry, Murdoch, you'll do just fine. I'm sure you're right. It's just a ceremony, after all. I'm not talking about the ceremony, me old mucker. <laughs> sir, I'll say this just once. She has experience. You don't be a challenge for a man. Sir, I really... Trust don't. me, I've been there. 
Mrs. Brackenbury? Margaret? God, no. I'm talking about Susie Walters from Barnsley. Oh, I knew I wasn't first past the post with her. The trick, Murdoch, is to fake it. Fake it, sir? Convince yourself that every time you imagine doing it, you actually did it. Sure, who's the man? That's what she wants. Don't, whatever you do, let her take charge. That road leads to nowhere good. rather close, aren't you? I believe we've got two minutes to spare. Uh, where's the bride? I'm sure she'll be along presently. What's the rush? The quartet's only booked until eight. Oh, there she is now. You mustn't see the bride before the wedding. It's oh, fine. I'm sure. Thomas! Get you married, Murdoch. so happy to see you here before me today, coming as you have to enter into the bonds of holy matrimony. Oh, oh yeah, well, go on, sir, sir, I lost the ring. I lost the ring, so there was a hole in my pocket, it must have fallen through. Chuffing old crap tree. I've looked everywhere for it, sir. Never mind, we'll use Margaret's. George, George. I found it in your tools, Ryder. Henry, you're my best man. <laughs> Toy, stop that, come on. Oh. Man and woman are not two, but they are one. This union that God has made cannot be separated. For George, can one do you have the ring? That yes, of course. And Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but Julia. have not love, I am a noisy God. Or a Why was Wainwright wearing Thompson's and ring the night the hotel clerk first saw him? He's trying to impersonate him, I suppose. Wouldn't Mrs. Thompson have noticed if the man was wearing her husband's wedding ring? If I have given away all that I have... What if it's the reverse? Reverse? What if the man the night clerk saw was her husband? Impersonating Wainwright. Has anybody ever met Mr. Thompson? His wife identified him. She could have lied. Who would think to question her? Especially when she was the main suspect in his murder. So the person sending the postcard and telegram was her husband. What's going on? Love never ends. She's leaving town on the 632. We have to stop them. Yes. <gasps> Thomas! Stop right there. What's going on? Inspector. Mrs. Mary Thompson and her husband are getting away with murder. Whose husband? Thompson is Wainwright. Wainwright is Thompson. Who's that? Wainwright. Wainwright. Sir, we have no time to waste. They're getting away. I don't bloody care. You're not leaving until you're officially married. Sir, I said... Get married. That's right. Yes, yes, of course, of course. Welcome back. Can we hurry? Yes. And the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helpmate. And so from the soil, the Lord God fashioned all the wild beasts. <clears throat> Father, yes. the vows. Of course. 
William Murdoch, do you take this woman to be your wife? Do you promise to be true to her in good times and bad, in sickness and in health? Do you promise to love her and honor her all the days of your life? I do. And do you, Julia, take this man to be your husband? Do you promise to love her? I do. I I truly do. Then by the authority of the church, I ratify and bless this bond of marriage in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. The ring. Go. George. Well, that's, that's quite clever. George, Henry, there's a 632 train bound for Buffalo. Go to Union Station. Have the constables look for Mary Thompson and have someone man the call box. Sir. But the reception! Wainwright was the money man. Thompson had a fortune to gain by his death. But if Thompson was pretending to be Wainwright, then where was Wainwright? Not in Toronto. Thompson came ahead of time to establish himself as Wainwright. Once the real Mr. Wainwright arrived, he was killed. And Mary pretended the victim was her husband. What on earth were you? Oh, the lads from the station house. Hopefully Mrs. Thompson is still at home. Hello? Where's Mrs. Thompson? She's gone. Gone where? Gone station, I believe. William, they're not crossing the border. They're trying to flee east. Telephone the police call box at Union Station. Tell the constable there to meet Detective William Murdoch at Dawn Station. Certainly, sir. Thank you. Dawn Station, please. I'm not finished. Oh, we have no time. I'm afraid we're at an impasse until this clears up. Dr. Ogden, what are you doing here? We're looking for your husband. My husband is dead. The man you identified as your dead husband was Alexander Wainwright. That's absurd. Being audacious is a better word. Well, you have no proof. Not yet. I got your missus, Murdoch. What's going on? Have you searched the train? Lad's been through it, sir. There's no sign of him. Well, unless you have some evidence to back up this ridiculous theory, I've got a train to catch. George, search this trunk. Mrs. Thompson, your train. Mercy! Mary! Mary! Sorry. George. Oh, that's enough, Crabtree. Break him up. Oh, that's enough. No, Mercy. Mary. 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 Sir, Margaret, the reception. At least they were true to their vows, till death to them part. <laughs> Excuse me, you do one more song, the wedding waltz, not me. Scotch set the bar. I assume that's why you came back. The job comes first, Margaret, you know that. All I know is that my perfect wedding turned into a perfect disaster. As long as the marriage is perfect, what does it matter? <laughs> a perfect marriage? There's no such thing. Why are they playing the wedding walls? Apparently I missed the first one. Mrs. Brackenhead. Would you care to dance? Oh, Thomas. <laughs> Congratulations! They came back. Of course they did. Shall we? It is our dance, after all. Indeed. So, are you giving your toast to the groom? Well, I fear the moment has passed, then. Would you like to hear it? Certainly. <clears throat> to Detective Murdoch, may he always be as happy as he looks today. 
Is that it? Do you have anything to wear? No. I believe that says it all. Oh. My hair must look a fright. Oh, never looked lovelier. I think this has been the perfect wedding day. With one exception. I have yet to kiss the bride. Thank you.